Right. Today, uh, we will try to motivate a very important equation in kinetic theory, namely the Boltzmann equation, which is uh, along lines which somewhat different to the ones that we have been following so far. Uh, we looked at the Langevin model, the generalized Langevin model, a lot of linear response theory, etc. But then the question arises as to whether there is a more basic way of deriving densities in phase space, in particular uh, the one particle density say, the simplest of these uh, such densities. Well, uh, this was a problem of kinetic theory and a great deal of work was done in the 19th century as well as the 20th century on this. A lot of problems still remain to be solved in this area and I will try to give you a flavor of how uh, even in the simplest of instances the problem uh, reduces to something which is fairly complicated and is fairly non-linear as you will see. I am not going to give a rigorous derivation of the Boltzmann equation, but I will point out what the physical assumptions are, very reasonable physical assumptions, justifying which is going to be much more complicated, but even without that just the mechanism involved is something which could be explained in reasonably simple terms. So let us look at that. Let us look at what the problem is and how it is tackled. So. This problem arose initially in the context of extremely dilute gases. When people were trying to derive from first principles things like the Maxwell distribution of velocities, etc. At the very foundations of uh, statistical physics, Boltzmann worked out what is now known as the Boltzmann equation in one form or the other and he motivated much of what happened later on. And this continues to be of great importance in many, many applications including plasma physics, fluid dynamics, etc., etc. Okay. Now what is the problem that we are going to look at? We have in mind a gas, a very dilute gas of particles which of course interact by collisions among the particles. To understand the collisions themselves, one would probably have to look at the quantum mechanical nature of these particles which is outside the purview of what we are going to do now. But given the fact that particles scatter off each other, there is some collision cross section which you can compute in principle. The question is what does it say about single particle densities? So the rest of the argument has to do with just physical arguments on how phase space densities evolve. Okay. Suppose you have n particles, a very dilute gas of n particles. We are not going to get into things like quantum statistics or anything like that with these particles. A very classical kind of gas, a very dilute gas and this gas is in thermal equilibrium. The question then arises, if you start with some initial conditions, which of course means that you are not talking, you are talking about special initial conditions, the question is how does the gas equilibrate? Or if you start by disturbing the gas a little bit by applying a field or something like that, how does it go back after you switch it off, how does it go back to the equilibrium distribution? So this is the question asked. Now of course to actually deduce what is happening to all the particles, every one of the particles in this gas is a formidable task. We need to know conditional probabilities or densities uh, of given a particle here, what is the probability of a particle there and the probability of yet another particle there and so on. That is formidable, but we could say all right, all these particles are on an equal footing and let us say, let us look at the phase space of any one of these particles, a given particle say. Now this phase space is described by three spatial coordinates and of course three momenta or three velocities. Since we are going to talk in terms of collisions, let us look at velocities instead. That is the conventional way it is done. So we will say that a particle is described by specifying its position and velocity at any given time t. Okay. Now this space of all possible r's and v's and r is inside the volume of the container if you like, that space, the phase space of a single particle 
is known as new space. So the space occupied by these quantities is called mu space. And the idea is that this mu space is the same for all the particles. Any one of the particles will have the same set of possible values of r, possible values of t. So this single particle phase space is what I call mu space, okay. Then the particles of course are of a discrete nature, but we would like to have some kind of continuum description of these particles. So let us look at some numbers. At normal uh, temperature and pressure in a dilute gas, you have about 10 to the 25 molecules per cubic meter, okay. This space, if you now coarse grain it, if you try to make it into small cells, if you break up this space into cells, so let us suppose schematically you have uh, the velocity in that direction and the coordinate in this direction coarse schematically, graining. pardon me, the coarse graining mu space, yeah. the space, the phase space of a single part, one particle phase space. If I coarse grain it in some fashion, then uh, well, since in physical volume, I have already said that each cubic meter has 10 to the 25 particles. If you look at a physical volume of say 10 to the minus uh, 15 meter cubed, that is 10 to the minus 5 meters on each side a small cube, tenth of a millimeter on each side, or hundredth of a millimeter on each side, you still have about 10 to the 10 particles in it. So in that sense, these particles form practically a continuum even though you are looking at a point, a point as small as a volume of 10 to the minus 15 meter cube, which is pretty much like a point, but even then you have a very large number of particles in it. So let us suppose that you coarse grain it in this fashion and this thing here is what I would call uh, mu sub i, that is the ith cell in mu space, okay. And I label it by the points of its center. Then I can ask at any given instant of time t, what is the number of particles in this cell here? Let us call that number of particles f of r, v and t, where r and v are the coordinates here in this point of the center of that cell. So this is the number of particles in this volume at time t when multiplied by d3 r d3 v. So let, let me call this, uh, give it a shorthand. Let us call this delta mu i. That is the measure, the phase space measure of the ith cell, okay. So this is like a density number density if you like and it is a local quantity okay. And the idea is that you do not have very sharp variations of this f as you move from one cell to the neighboring cell etc. So you can treat this as a continuous variable here. And now the question is what is the total number of particles in the gas? The total number, remember that each particle, each of the n particles is represented by some somewhere in this space, in this mu space because each of them has an r and a v and therefore is some kind of point in this space and when you add up all these numbers, you are going to get the total number, okay. So it is clear that if I integrate d3 r, d3 v, f of r, well if I take this and sum it, I sum over i f of r v t delta mu i summed over i, all the cells i, this must be equal to n. Okay. And in the limit in which these volumes go to 0, in which these, uh, this measure goes to 0, this goes to an integral f of r v t d3 r d3 velocity and let me call this uh, dm. The shorthand for that I call dm. 
and this must be equal to m. If I integrate this quantity over r alone, right, what happens then? I get a volume. If I integrate over r, I get a volume and that will give me n over v, okay. But whatever, this is the constraint, this is the normalization of this single particle density. And the whole point of kinetic theory is to find out what this f is, okay. So that is the task to calculate this f of r v t because from that it is like the density for uh, phase space density for a single particle. From that I should be able to find all kinds of physical properties, so transport what, properties what and so on. I am not given anything at the moment except this condition. And I have tried to try to find this ab initio. Okay. It will sort of satisfy some kind of differential equation, and I have to tell you what it is. And of course, the no standard problem would be given the value of f of r v t at t equal to 0, initial condition, find out what it does at later times. That would be the typical problem. So the whole target is to find an equation for this. Okay. Just as when we did density matrices, for instance, in classical or quantum mechanics, we found there was an equation for the density operator, the Liouville equation. It says delta rho over delta t was equal to the Poisson bracket or commutator of rho with h or h with rho, right. We want a comparable equation for this f here. Now we are going to assume that the gas is dilute, okay. What that means is that uh, it's so so dilute that it's spread apart that the the Broglie wavelength of each of these particles is much smaller than the thermal wavelength. That of course as you know is the standard um, criterion for non-degenerate in the quantum mechanical sense, for non-degeneracy in the quantum sense, namely that the thermal wavelength, so schematically what it means is you have little fuzzy objects which are the individual particles and these fellows should be at a distance considerably greater than the fuzziness in the position of each of these particles, right. So you want to say that lambda thermal which is equal to Planck's constant divided by the average momentum but in a free gas the kinetic energy is proportional to kT, p squared over m is proportional to kT. So p is proportional to square root of m kT roughly, right. So you want this square root of m k Boltzmann t, this fellow here, must be much, much smaller than the interparticle separation. Now the volume per particle is V over n and that is like a three-dimensional, it is the cube of the interparticle separation. So you want this to be much, much less than V over n to the power one-third. That is the condition under which classical statistical mechanics will apply, right? Yeah. Sir, didn't we have a Liouville force? Should I, should not I have a? Liouville force is like we have R U for the Liouville force. Does R and V take care of this? Yeah, because this is saying that once you prescribe for me how the particles are distributed in this phase space and that is the end of it, right? Yes, if you like. Yeah, I already said that R and V are the coordinates of this point here, the middle point. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So if I bring it to this side, it says uh, the number density. If I define n equal to n divided by v, number of particles per unit volume, it says n h cube over m k Boltzmann t to the three halves much, much greater than 1. That is the condition for classical statistics as you know. Low densities, high temperatures. 
and then this becomes much, much less than 1. For the gas in this room, for instance, nitrogen gas at normal temperature and pressure, this quantity will be of the order of 10 to the minus 6 or minus 7 or something like that and then you are in very good shape. On the other hand, if you go to extremely low temperatures and higher densities, then you are in a very degenerate situation, right. If you go to something like uh, a neutron star, this quantity becomes enormous, this thing here. And then at even relatively high temperatures, you would still have this would get reversed in the other direction, okay. And then you have to do full quantum statistics, okay. So we are going to work in this regime in this classical, completely classical regime, okay. Now the matter is very simple if you did not have collisions at all. First of all, throughout we are going to neglect to start with collisions with the walls, okay, because now we have to then deal with the atomic structure of the walls and ask what the interaction is. We are going to ignore that and look at what happens in the bulk first and then this is what happens to this F. If you consider what happens to f of r v t d mu, okay, d3 r, d3 v, etc., and ask what happens to these as t goes to t plus dt, okay, then a particle in this cell at this position would maybe get out of this cell, it would acquire a new position and a new velocity depending on what force there is on this particle. Huh? Let us suppose you impose an external force on the particle, not collisions, an external force on this particle, some F, okay, capital F and that force could vary with time but very slowly compared to the time scale of molecular motion. It could change with position, we do not care, whatever. Then this quantity, all the particles here would move into new positions, coordinates would be equal to F of R plus V delta T okay. and V becomes V plus F over M delta T and the time is of course T plus delta T. That is the density multiplied by d mu prime, where mu prime refers to the measure of the cell corresponding to these coordinates, okay. So this is clearly conservation of number. Nothing has happened, these people, have, these molecules have moved into some other cell in this phase space, okay. We will assume delta t to be quite small. And the cells to be adequately small, and the limit, we are going to take limit in which all these things become point objects, but that is what this conservation law is to start with in the absence of collisions, no collisions. Okay. But now, yeah. Mm -hmm. Tells me the number of particles in the mu space in a certain given cell. Right. So, but that in a given cell, the number of particles can always change, right? It so will. That total it, number should. That's be why it's changing with time. Sure. But then this imposes the fact that in a given mu cell itself, the number of particles are same before and after. That's no, no, no. Oh, okay. It's a different cell. Okay. All I am saying is this set of particles moves out, right? This is the way it evolves in time. In a sufficiently small interval delta t, the velocity changes by v plus f over m delta t. This is the acceleration, right? This is the change of momentum divided by mass. That is your change of velocity, okay? So that is the whole point may be a complicated equation of motion, but we are looking at a very infinitesimal interval of time, okay. So that is all it is in the absence of collisions. But we also know that if this happened in phase space, 
imagine for a moment we are working in phase space in Hamiltonian dynamics in R and P. Then we know the motion is such that phase space volume elements are preserved under time. It is like an incompressible fluid, okay. But we are working with velocities here. But this is still true, this is still true and if you look at uh, Huang's book for instance in statistical mechanics where a nice derivation is given of this Boltzmann equation, he points out that this is still true even in terms of the velocities. Essentially in this problem it is kind of trivial that it is true because what happens is if in the volume element you have this initial volume element in R and P you have this. then uh, since R changes by R plus V dt and P, V changes by a similar kind of thing, this goes over into something that looks like the origin is shifted, it looks like this. It, and you can show this area is equal to this area by simple geometry which I am not going to do now. Okay. And you are assuming but that the dt is much much less than the average time interval between the two collisions. How can you I have I've said I have switched off all collisions. Okay. I said we do not have collisions. The problem will arise when we are going to include collisions which you have to. But I am trying to see what happens purely geometrically without collisions if you ignore collisions. So let us put it another way. This is in the absence of collisions which is equivalent to saying this is in the case in which the particles can go right through each other without affecting each other, okay. Imagine they float through each other without, they do not know about each other's presence. So the scattering cross section is 0, okay. Then this would be true. But we have to include the scattering cross section which we will do in a moment. So since d mu equal to d mu prime, right, it implies that this is equal to that explicitly, right. But what does that mean? We can now go to the limit in which delta t goes to 0 implies this f is equal to this f in the limit in which delta t goes to 0. And let us expand, Taylor expand this, the first term cancels and retain to first order in the infinitesimals, right. That immediately tells you delta f over delta t if there is explicit t dependence and then when you differentiate with respect to this, you get the convective derivative part. Gradient r with respect to Rf okay. and when I differentiate this I get plus f over m dot gradient with respect to V f equal to 0 in the absence of collisions. Okay. But now there are collisions. They certainly are collisions. The whole physics is because there are collisions. Equilibration occurs because there are collisions. So this is wrong. And what has been left out is precisely due to collisions. This differs from this precisely by the extra term due to collisions. So this is. So that is our first equation and everything is sitting here, everything is in this term here, pardon me, pardon me, normal derivative with respect to what, this is the, te why, this is the way in which the f changes in a time, the change in f in a time delta t due to collisions is delta f over delta t times delta t. I have just cancelled out the delta t's on both sides, okay. So what is the subscript collisions imply? It is the contribution 
to this F due to collisions. We do not know what is happening to this F due to collision. So now we are going to ask what is going to happen, right. So you had a certain number of particles in this uh, d mu in here, here is a molecule. In the time between T and T plus delta T, a molecule can come and hit this and throw this out of this cell. So it will deplete it. Okay. On the other hand, there may be a collision here between two molecules and in the time between T and T plus delta T, this fellow may get in here that will add to this F and you therefore have to take into account both these fellows out here. Hmm? Things which get in will increase this F and things which get out will decrease this F, right. So this is equal to R bar minus R, this is standard notation and I will explain what this R and R bar are. You have two body effects. Exactly. Two or N body, N we do not know, we do not know as yet, okay. We do not know what these collisions are like. We are now going to start systematically making approximations, okay. So R delta T equal to number of particles that, oh yes, we now make an assumption, we now make a crucial assumption that the cell is so small that any collision takes it out of the cell. We are going to count the number of collisions. So we need to know what these collisions do. You may have a collision which still leaves it in the cell, a very mild collision. But we are going to say the cell size is so small in the limit of zero volume that any collision takes you out of the cell because finally what is happening, we are trying to find a local differential equation, completely local equation at each point. So some kind of continuum approximation is being made and the idea is that any collision kicks you out of the cell. Okay. So number of particles that leave d mu, our, our cell at the point r at the volume, at the velocity v. So that is R delta T, okay. And similarly R bar, number that come in, into D mu due to collisions in, in this time interval. It is a very standard kind of assumption that you say that uh, these collisions are such that any collision gets you out of it, but there could also be some collisions that bring you into it. This is like these assumptions which uh, in the case of Markov processes there is a gain and there is a loss term in any rate equation. It is pretty much in the same uh, spirit here. We have still not said anything about dilute. We have to explain where this uh, dilute business comes in. We have only assumed that any collision, the cells are sufficiently small that collisions knock you out of it, right. Now the question is what sort of collisions are we talking about? Uh, in the simplest instance, let us assume these are elastic collisions. So the energy is conserved in these collisions, there is no absorption. When two molecules collide, they come out with the total kinetic energy is the same before and after the collision, okay. And we have an elaborate theory of scattering in quantum mechanics to describe scattering part, uh, processes. But in the simplest instance, we will assume that the collisions are binary collisions. Namely only two at a time. The idea is that the probability of three particles scattering off each other at the same instant of time is 0, effectively 0, which is a very good approximation. Yeah. 
Ah, there will be fluctuations, but the assumption is that look at the cell size that you are talking about. It is sufficiently large that you are in the continuum approximation as far as the number of particles is concerned. So it is not as if you are looking at a cell size in which all of a sudden 10 to the 15 particles will make become 10 particles for instance. That is not going to happen ever, okay. The probability of such a large number of fluctuation is negligibly small, okay. It is always true, I mean even in the gas in this room for instance, it is a binomial distribution in thermal equilibrium. So the probability of something which is very far away from the mean is going to be extremely small. Yeah. So that would imply that the mean path length of uh, molecule should be larger than mm -hmm. the cell size itself. Yeah. So that after the collision it does not actually moves out of the cell. Yes. So then you will need an intersection of the fact that the cell size needs to be large enough so that. Yes. So is that. Is yeah. That, that is built in. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. We will we'll see what where this gets us. Yes. So the question is, is this going to be exact and the answer is no. It is not an exact equation, but we know the precise conditions under which the approximation is valid and for dilute gases it will turn out to be an extremely good one, okay. Now the crucial assumption is this business of binary collisions that the collision events are all two particle collisions, okay. Now what happens in a two particle elastic collision is very simple. If you have a particle uh, with velocity V1 uh, colliding with a particle with velocity V2 then if these particles go to new particle, if the same particles go out with velocities V1 prime and V2 prime for instance. So you have uh, some collision event happening in which uh, you have V1 coming in, V2 coming in there and then this goes off V1 prime and V2 prime in this fashion. Then the conservation of momentum in this case they are all assumed to be equal mass particles is of course that V1 prime plus V2 prime. That is the first equation and the second one says the energy is conserved, right. So it says V1 squared plus V2 squared go to V1 prime squared. Now in this situation it is obviously sensible to go to a frame of reference in which you are in the center of mass so a frame of reference so that it looks like two fellows coming in and two fellows going out in this fashion. So in the center of mass frame of reference the collision will not look like this at all in the CM frame it looks like two particles are coming in in this fashion with equal and opposite velocities. So this comes in say with some u over 2 and this is minus u over 2 and then after collision they go off in this fashion. So this is u prime over 2 and this fellow is minus u prime over 2. And how is that achieved? Well, you go to a frame of reference in which the, the capital V, the center of mass has a velocity capital V which is half V1 plus V2 to start with. So let us convert to V equal to half V1 plus V2 and U is V2 minus V1. That is the relative velocity. Similarly for the prime coordinates, so V prime equal to half V1 prime plus V2 prime and U prime equal to V2 prime minus V1 prime, okay. Then what is the content of these two equations? Well the first one of course is that capital V equal to V prime, that is trivial. Total initial velocity here is equal to the same thing out there and 
this thing here if you substitute for little v1, little v2, etc. in terms of capital V and U, it becomes the cross term V dot whatever cancels out and you are left with uh, U equal to U prime where the magnitude of the relative velocity is the same, is unchanged in an elastic collision. So for all practical purposes, you can view this as scattering of particles of velocity u in a fictitious potential, whatever that potential be. Okay. And we know how to do scattering theory in that case. Okay. So you have a center of attraction, center of force for example, some potential and then you have an incident beam of particles coming in with a velocity u. If you treat this quantum mechanically, then particles scatter off in all possible directions and one of the fundamental problems of the fundamental problem of quantum scattering theory is to find out the flux of particles in any solid angle, okay. That depends on the nature of this potential. It depends on the, 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 the spherical symmetry or not, it etc. depends on the potential here. But it is a one body problem effectively. Classically too, we can solve the problem. You give me the potential and I tell you what the scattering in different directions is, okay. Rutherford scattering for example from a Coulomb potential will tell you exactly what the differential cross section is in various directions. So that is a problem in scattering theory and it essentially says that at the end of the day if you ask what is given an incident flux in some direction, what is the number of particles, what is the flux of particles that is coming out in a solid angle d omega at an azimuthal angle phi and polar angle theta with respect to this incident direction here. So this problem is a problem in scattering theory, okay. And what is, uh, how is that solved? That is solved by saying this uh, number of particles the flux, uh, let us say, number of particles uh, scattered into the cone of solid angle d omega per unit time. is equal to what? Well, it will depend on the incident flux, the number of particles coming in per unit area per unit time to start with. So let me call that uh, incident flux equal to incident flux multiplied by the scattering cross section, the differential scattering cross section, right? So this is equal to d sigma which depends on omega over d omega times d omega because I am asking for the number in d omega and this is the differential cross section this quantity in this two particle scattering geometry a lot of interesting things happen. First of all uh, it is easy to show that the measure does not change that it is this is a simple exercise I want you to show this from these algebraic equations you can show that d3 v1 d3 v2 equal to d3 v d3 u if I change variables that is equal to d3 v prime d3 u prime okay, which in turn is equal to d3 v1 prime d3 v2 prime. So this volume element in phase in velocity space does not change under the scattering okay. The rest is just come is just um, 
simple algebra it simply says counting just counting because we need to find out the following yes let us look at the term r first we have r bar minus r delta t let us look at what gets out of this phase space cell okay in a time delta t okay. what is that going to depend on it is going to depend on the incident flux so let us pretend that we we know this quantity by solving the scattering problem and let us pretend that v1 we fix v1 at some value and ask what are all those v2s which will cause this scattering out into some cone or the other okay what are all those v2s so we for a fixed v1 we want all the v2s which will hit against this v1 in that phase space cell in time t to t plus delta t and kick it out okay so it is equal to the incident flux multiplied by this scattering cross section but the incident flux is provided by what it is provided by f of r v2 because that is what is hitting against the v1 at time t right multiplying multiplying the differential cross section of omega and any other factor well you have to integrate over all these fellows here d3 v2 and integral we do not care what angle it gets scattered into so you have to keep hit uh, before we get to this we have not finished with the incident flux yet we need to have all those particles which are within a mod u of it because per unit time so mod v2 minus v1 and then d sigma omega so this is going to be the r for a fixed v1 yes the, no the condition on v2 comes from but this is going to depend this is a function of u it will be a function of the energy and of course the angles because what is happening is that if you have a scattering center here in this geometry in this geometry I ask how many particles are going to go here that is going to depend on what the initial velocity is or initial energy is because this is elastic scattering okay u prime is equal to u so it will definitely depend on mod u and then relative to this direction of u it will depend on what this scattering angle is eta and it will also depend on what the phi is in this direction i have included both of them in writing omega okay if it's a spherically symmetric potential then it won't depend on the phi but it will still depend on theta here and of course on the incident energy which is measured by mod u here right so that is the that is sitting here this is providing the factor in the flux the number per unit time depends on how many of them can reach this point the, the particle we want to be scattered out okay so this is going to be the r term okay but that is for one particle but all those which are sitting in this phase space within the volume element d3r r1 are going to get scattered out right so you must multiply this once again by f of r v1 that is the number of scattering centers so r is going to be proportional to this oh we do not care in what direction these particle get scattered out so there is also an integral over this so I should bring that fellow down here and then write this let us put this in 
but there is an integral over d 3 v 2. All the molecular uh, details of the actual scattering process, actual collision etc., is sitting here. So the computation of this is a separate story altogether. But in a very rough sense because of this binary approximation you have two of these fellows sitting here. and mod v1 minus v2 absolutely that is what couples the two. Okay. So this is what r is proportional to it is essentially the r okay. but what is r bar which is those which are getting scattered outside to get into this phase space okay how are we going to find that well we argue in the following way if you have uh, a scattering process it is equal to it is actually equal to yeah. okay. if you have a scattering process in which uh, v1 plus v2 goes to v1 prime plus v2 prime then assuming that the dynamics is time reversal invariant the scattering process in which v1 prime plus v2 prime combine to give, give you v1 plus v2 as a final products is also possible and has the same probability okay. So by the by the symmetry time reversal symmetry it turns out the scattering cross section for that process is the same as a scattering cross section for the original for this process okay it is exactly the same. So there are uh, some intermediate steps in between where you have to show this is really true and so on and so forth but we will take this uh, let me just make a statement that owing to time reversal symmetry plus the overall rotation symmetry of this uh, and inversion uh, reflection symmetry of this scattering process the other scattering cross section for v1 prime v2 prime scattering into v1 and v2 is exactly the same as this right. So therefore we introduce some notation so it is conventional to call f1 f1 of r f of f of r v1 t is conventional to call it f1 we want prime t equal to f1 prime and similarly f of r v2 prime t equal to f2 prime then r bar is exactly the same thing except that you have the primes here sitting here and it turns out that this is exactly the same factor with suitable changes remember that mod v1 prime minus v2 prime was the same as mod v1 minus v2 okay so that is also put in is used and you end up with an equation which essentially says that uh, delta f over delta t of r v1 t that is our fixed velocity to start with plus v1 dot del r let us put the f outside uh, f okay uh, v1 t plus the external force f over m dot gradient v1 f of r v1 t on the right hand side is equal to dv2 d3v2 integral d sigma uh, differential cross section and then inside f1 prime f2 prime minus 
f 1 f 2 mod v 1. And notice what these quantities are. F 1 is this quantity, F 2 stands for this quantity here and that is integrated over the V 2 is integrated over. So, all those V 2s such that the relative velocity is V 1 minus V 2 is integrated with this weight factor and this quantity depends on that modulus on this modulus here it is a function of that as well as the angles involved. Similarly, for the prime quantities where these primes stand for V 1 prime, V 2 prime such that V 1 prime minus V 2 prime modulus is equal to V 1 minus V 2 modulus. So, those quantities V 1 prime V 2 prime are determined in terms of V 1 and V 2. Ultimately, these are the fellows scattering into the volume, these are the fellows scattering out of the volume. That is the, the measure of these quantities here and the binary business comes here. But now let us stand back and look at this. The moment you see an equation like this, first of all, it is an integral differential equation to start with. This is the famous Boltzmann equation in this language. But what is the most striking thing about it? All these quantities were very similar to the kind of things we had and we wrote down various Walker Planck equations and so on. But now this is nothing to do with that. There is no randomness or anything like that. We are just saying we are going to look at all deterministic processes such that the phase space density changes due to collisions. But the most striking thing of all is that this is nonlinear in this F. So, it is a non-linear integral differential equation, extremely formidable to solve mathematically or even to show the existence of solutions under suitable conditions. Okay. So, already even with the simplest of assumptions with binary collisions and so on and so forth, even if you knew the dynamics, even if you knew the scattering cross section here, you still have the problem that you got to solve this integral differential equation which is highly nonlinear. okay. So, that is the root of the source of the problems, the source of the difficulty, okay. Now, where did this question of dilute come in? Well, we assume that these two things are independent of each other. So, we assume that two particles which collide have no correlation at all. no memory, no correlation at all. Those who collide once are gone forever, after that they do not see each other again. Okay. And moreover that it is uniform across R, independent of R, the same geometry applies. So, in that sense we are really using this uh, so called molecular chaos assumption of uh, Boltzmann that there is no correlation of this kind and there is independent of velocity space, position space, the velocity distributions uh, act in this multiplicative manner. Okay. Now, of course, if you have correlations between particles, this is not true anymore. So, if you go to dense gases, this is not true. Even with binary collisions, this kind of assumption is not true anymore. Okay. And there are many cases where it is spectacularly not true at all. For instance, if you imagine gas an elastic uh, gas of equal mass particles on a line, one dimension, then you know that in one dimension when you have equal mass particles, when two particles collide, they just exchange velocities, right. So, if you have one particle A in between two particles B and C, then all the collisions of A are always with B or with C. So, the number of re-collisions all collisions are re-collisions in some sense. At best, there is one more particle with which it can collide in between two collisions with one neighbor, neighbor on one side. So, it is the opposite extreme. It is highly correlated. 
it is extremely correlated, controlled entirely by recollisions, but the Boltzmann equation assumes there are no recollisions at all, it is completely neglected it, right. And in three dimensions that pretty much, it is clear that it is pretty much valid, this assumption is valid. When two fellows collide with each other, they are gone after that. So this is the most elementary way of sort of motivating the derivation of the Boltzmann equation. I have not gone through all the steps, but very roughly this is what it entails in this case. The rest has to do with approximations, how to linearize this, what are the assumptions one makes to linearize it, etc. For instance, in plasma physics, there is a very famous approximation called the Vlasov equation, which follows from the Boltzmann equation, etc. But that gets set into kinetic theory and that is not my purpose really. Uh, one uh, problem that one should tackle with this is uh, all the transport coefficients. So there is an elaborate theory which will tell you how to compute the viscosity of this gas, dilute gas using starting with the Boltzmann equation this fashion, making suitable approximations. But I thought I should uh, mention this thing here because the, our earlier assumptions were all stochastic in nature. But now we are dealing with a situation where we do not have a tagged particle that is much more massive than the rest of the particles. All of them are on equal footing completely, right. So that is one of the reasons why the equation is not expected to be as simple as in the case where you have a very heavy particle and it is distinct from all the rest from the heat path, okay. So maybe I will stop here today and uh, uh, any questions and comments we will take it next time.